Um, so let's get right to it today. I'm pleased to introduce our featured speaker for this um, event this afternoon. Uh, David Ernst is on the graduate faculty and is the CIO in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. He brings an extensive background in education to this role with 14 years of teaching and a PhD in learning technology. He's also the executive director of the Open Textbook Network. This program works to improve higher education access, affordability, and, sex, and su success for all students through the advancement of open textbooks. Uh, through this initiative, David created and manages the Open Textbook Library, a single source for faculty to find quality openly licensed textbooks. Additionally, because these weren't enough, David leads the College of Education and Human Development's mobile initiative, integrating iPads into the first year experience program for around 450 college freshmen each year. David and his colleagues have documented how these mobile devices have especially benefited students from disadvantaged backgrounds. So please join me in welcoming David Ernst uh, to the podium today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, am I on? Well, thank you very much. Um, Wow, that's, I, I couldn't have asked for a better kind of lead in and the issues uh, that uh, were just raised are exactly why we're doing what we're doing and why we're here today. We just ran a, this afternoon a, a workshop for, for faculty to try to get them engaged in some of these open educational uh, resources, open textbooks, and I'll tell you a little bit about that today. Um, but wow, I mean, what, what you said uh, is exactly uh, right on to uh, why we're partnering with, with the Ohio State University is that um, we're in this place in higher education right now that is uh, so challenging in so many ways. And I want to talk about that a little bit today, why, and why open educational resources and open textbooks specifically are um, a solution that has so much hope uh, and so much uh, possibility. So, See if I can figure out how to work this. There we go. So, so we're going to talk about open textbooks today. That's been our focus. Um, and I'm actually going to uh, not jump right into textbooks. To be honest, textbooks for me are, are not um, the important thing. The important thing is a little bit bigger picture. I want to start there a little bit to make sure we're all with an under, the understanding. Sometimes when you get involved with technology, that, that's kind of my job all day, every day is technology. And you get kind of wrapped into the technology and you forget why. I don't want us to forget why. And so, so I'm going to show family photos for an hour, if that's OK. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is where I kind of ground myself. This is my family. And someone, a, a colleague asked me the other day, you have some gawky looking sons. How did your, how did your daughter look so, end up so beautiful? That's my wife. So she loved hearing that. But um, So I have three boys here. These three boys, two of them are in college, one at the University of Minnesota, one at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and the third one is a senior and will be at the University of Minnesota. I couldn't get them to leave the state. I tried, but I, they wouldn't. Uh, the third one will be at the University of Minnesota next year. They'll all be in school at the same time. So if we could figure out this affordability thing like today, <laughs> I would really, really appreciate it. So, but when I think about what I really want from them, for them, excuse me, you know, I, I, I mean, I, these are really critical years for them developmentally, both as people, as human beings, and the growth they experience in college and in, in the years that they're there. We want them to be productive citizens uh, in our democracy. Um, excuse me, we want them to be, be educated, uh, so we have an educated uh, democracy. We want, to, want them to be productive in society, whatever that means to them. Um, I have a lot of things I hope for them, and college is a struggle. It can be a struggle in a lot of ways. And I have no doubt that every parent in the world wants the same thing for their sons and daughters as I want for my boys. No doubt in that. And in fact, I mean, if the whole world can agree on this, I think we in this room can agree that, that this should be, access to higher education should be really a universal human right for those reasons I just expressed. And, um, you know, when I, first, when I first read this, when I first saw this, you know, and, and it is in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I, my immediate kind of naive US-centric 
perspective on it was, oh, those poor people in other countries that you know, don't have access to higher education. And um, when I got involved with, um, um, uh, actually, it was first this iPad project we mentioned, but then eventually into this content area of open textbooks and so on, I realized that there are plenty of access issues to higher education right at the University of Minnesota and right at higher education generally and in the US. Lots of them. And mainly because of uh, cost. Because of, of cost. So I want to spend a little bit of time explaining why that is and why we are in a time in history in higher education that's different than ever before. Honestly, different than ever before. That may sound a little extreme, but it is. And I'll, I'll try to show you that. This is a study that was done for the US Department of Education that said basically in the first decade of this century that 2.4 million students did not complete college because of cost. And these are students who were college, what it, college qualified. In other words, they took all the right courses in high school. They did just fine in them. They did well enough to be accepted into college and do well. And they didn't. And so these aren't like all the students who didn't finish college. These are just the ones attributing cost to the reason. The cost is the reason they didn't finish. And this was the study's most conservative number, actually. And so, um, so here we go. Here's statistic number one. Here's number two. Here's US higher education funding. And, and as you know, as, as was mentioned already, the funding comes from two basic places. Tuition, government funding, right? State funding, usually. The green line is state funding. The red line is tuition. And so back when I was in school, back here, uh, I was paying, what, maybe 25% of the tuition, of the cost of me going to school. And now it's more like 50-50. And this is averaged across all states in the US. Some are better than others. Here's Ohio. So again, back in 88, 35-65 about. Student 35, and now it's flipped. Really, the student's paying the, the, the majority of it. This is... Uh, this is the number of hours, this is University of Minnesota data, sorry about that, that's all I could find. Uh, this is the number of hours a student would have to work at a minimum wage job, which is what they typically have, to afford one year of tuition at the University of Minnesota. So back in 1960, uh, back when my dad was a student at Ohio State, um, I was born in Columbus because of that. Uh, the, they could work about 200 hours to afford tuition. That's just tuition. That's not room and board. That's not uh, books. That's not anything else. But about 200 hours, that's a summer job. Right? You could do that in a summer to pay the tuition for the year. So now, today, it's more like 1,700 hours, which if you do the math, it's getting pretty close to a full-time job all year round. Uh, my son was a, worked at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport last summer you know, one of the convenience places, uh, working pretty much minimum wage, made more, I mean, worked more than 40 hours a week. And I'm pretty sure it paid for his books this year and maybe a little bit more, you know, a few thousand dollars is what he, what he made. Um, and our costs are very comp comparable, I think, to Ohio State. So it's, um, it's a challenge. It's different than it's ever been before, really. So if you, if there is this, sorry, if, there, if there's this difference and students are being asked to pay so much more, there's only really three ways you can do that. You either have the money, it's handed to you, you need to work for the money, which again is, being more, is more and more of a stressor on them, or you have to borrow the money. If you can think of other ways, print money, I suppose, we can print money. No, if you, uh, so if borrowing money, two-thirds of students borrow money, and, and on average they borrow about $30,000 a year. That's, or excuse me. Their debt is $30,000 on average. Those borrowers have a debt of about $30,000. The green line here is credit card debt, US-wide, total amount of credit card debt. And it's, it dipped above a trillion dollars there right before the crash, and then people stopped borrowing for a while. The red line is student loan debt. And the amazing thing about this number really is that, for me, is that this is only eight or nine years ago, 2006, and it's at $500 billion. And today, eight or nine years later, it's at $1.3 trillion. So we're, seeing the, we're really seeing the effects of this and this 
on the debt that students are carrying. And you can Google any given week, just Google like student loans or student debt or something like that, you will find stories every week about it. It's a big, big issue about defaults, um, about how underwater students are, and so on. So, so there you go. Uh, depressed? Are you depressed yet? Um, you know, this is reality, and I, I will continue to assert that it's different for my kids than it ever has been. For me, for anyway, it's a different world. And so, you know, what can, what can we in this room do? You know, and, you know, for the, the faculty that I talked to earlier today that we worked with, what can they do? Chances are there isn't anyone in here that can just say, okay, let's just, let's lower tuition or let's, you know, no, that's, we can't do that. But one thing we can't do have control over as faculty, obviously, is the, are the course materials, the books that we ask students to purchase. So that's what we're going to focus on, something we can do, right? And it may not be the biggest percentage of the cost, but as already was pointed out, it's, it is big enough. It's uh, actually quite a, quite a lot. The cost of textbooks has increased uh, by about four times the rate of inflation. The green line there is consumer price index, that's inflation. And the red line is uh, textbook costs as they've increased over time. And a decade ago, there, about a decade ago, there was actually a US congressional inquiry into the cost of textbooks and why they're going up so quickly. And it obviously didn't slow anything down, unfortunately. The College Board uh, estimates that students spend about $1,200 a year on textbooks. Um, I would say, which sounds like that was uh, confirmed with the study done here, um, I would say most students probably don't actually spend that much. They're asked to spend that much. What do they do instead? Don't buy them. Find, they find ways to, because they need to, right? Because these costs. Yeah, well, we'll go over that. So on average, $1,200, at Ohio, uh, every institution is required by the federal law to, to have an estimated cost of attendance published on their website so that students know what they're getting into. Um, so Ohio State has on here, I just looked it up. Ohio State's got listed right up, kind of right along the average. I think the University of Minnesota is really close to that too, like 1100 um, if you're from a school that focuses on science engineering, it's closer to $2,000. We went to, uh, where was it, Oregon State, it was, I think, 1900 Purdue was uh, 1800 something like that. So, uh, a lot of money. Um, because there aren't, I, when, I, when I present to faculty, it's important that we get the voice, even though they hear the students every day, I do want to kind of get the voice of the student into the conversation a little bit. So I'm going to show you this. This is what we, we showed a faculty just to kind of uh, to make sure we ha have that voice of the student in here. So this was a just set up a camera on campus in Minnesota and asked them this question. What do you think about the cost of textbooks? It's really general. I think they're really valuable, but the cost is just a little, little too much for students who are always already paying a lot for tuition. Find a way to make costs more manageable because tuition is going up, everything's going up cost of living is going up and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just, um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced, yeah. I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them. So it's like, you know, you use it for a couple months and then probably never touch it again. If people weren't just um, issuing new editions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. It is kind of expensive. And sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, they cost way too much in general, I think. So if you're faculty, my guess is there's not a lot new that, in that. Uh, you've probably either heard that about your, either your own textbooks or someone else's textbooks or something like that. 
all of those issues that were raised there, there were tons of them, right? I mean, lots of little things about, you know, you only use a part of it, or we only use it for one semester, or I don't get to keep it, or I don't do blah, blah, blah. It's all cost related, right? If you imagine that there is no cost to the textbooks, those issues are all gone. None of those struggles that students are having, none of those complaints that they have about it are going to be there anymore. So um, I wanted to just, I, I always liked that video because they are, a, they're actually a pretty, a voice of reason there. They're pretty rational. They're, they weren't kind of going nuts on it. They were just kind of said, yeah, we get it. And we, we know that people are trying to do something. And, you know, they're, and they're not questioning the value of the course material or anything like that. They're just kind of saying, but it's just too much. So the other thing I just noticed earlier was, I don't think our, textbook, our bookstore at Minnesota needs to actually sell books anymore because they seem to be doing pretty well in apparel. I don't know if you noticed that, but I just noticed that this afternoon at the faculty meeting, like everyone's wearing the M and the, I think we're in good shape. Um, so given that stress and these kind of issues that they're, they're struggling with and having to make decisions about what they do, what do they do? They do, they do these things. And if you're faculty, you know that this is the case. More and more and more. Purchase an older edition, they delay buying it, or they just don't buy it at all. Right? This was a student, this is a student about a year, a year and a half ago, who, who said he was asked to buy an $80 French book, and he said he found one on eBay for $8, but it was two editions older. And he had pretty reasonable justification, didn't he? Uh, on the other hand, we know that in some ways he's putting himself at some academic risk, isn't he? Because when he's assigned readings or assignments or whatever in the book, and it doesn't match up with the current version, or there's content that doesn't exist in the old one, right? He's, he knows it too, he knew it, he admitted it, but he said, you know, you know, the French is French and I'll just take my chances. So he's taking some risk. As far as delaying textbook purchasing. In Minnesota at least, if financial aid doesn't, I, I assume it's the standard, doesn't come until after the drop deadline, right? Because they want to make sure you're actually in the class before they pay for it three weeks or so in. So that means there are a lot of students who don't have their textbook for three weeks, right? Um, and we, I found out also as we've been tr traveling around talking to other institutions that there, uh, this is the same thing for the military, uh, the GI Bill, right? There's paperwork that needs to get done and it takes time because of the cost and they need the GI Bill to pay for it. There's this delay as well. So imagine if you're in a math class and you don't have the book for three weeks and you have assignments every day and all right, you're going to be borrowing it or something. One more short little video with the students in it and I asked them that question, have you ever delayed the purchase of a textbook? I usually wait until uh, I feel like there's a need in the class to buy the textbook or if I'm falling behind he waits and I until can't find another resource behind. for free online that um, would also give me that information. And then I'll buy a textbook. I have delayed purchasing a textbook until it was completely necessary to have it. Yes, I have, unfortunately. <laughs> I had some troubles because of it. Textbooks are obviously something that you really obviously need. And in order to do well in a class, you know, you need to have that textbook. And because it costs so much, I think a lot of people have problems getting the required text. And therefore, they have struggled in classes they shouldn't necessarily struggle in. I think delaying the purchase of a textbook has now become the rule, not really the exception. I, I hear it from my boys all the time when I'm asking them about, oh, did you buy this yet? Uh, I think I'm going to wait to see if I really need it. I'm going to, maybe the freshmen buy it right up front because they don't, they don't know any better. But uh, I think generally it's become the rule, delaying. Um, so, and then, the, and then uh, not being able to purchase one at all, not purchasing one because of cost. I've seen three surveys now with numbers around the same, about 60 to 70% of students saying, and this isn't like every semester or every class, this is like in their academic career, have you ever chosen not to purchase a textbook because, or had to because of the cost? And they said no. So they're, again, the delay, the not buying it, those are all academic risks that they're taking that they feel they need to take for the cost issue, because of the cost issue. And so if there's you know, nothing else you remember today, this is what happens when students are forced to take those risks. 
This is a survey from the state of Florida. I think it uh, has an N of about 22,000 or something like that is my memory, um, where they are asked about the impact. And I really think that if this was public knowledge, I mean, if, if, an inst if institutions knew this, really, there isn't an institution in this country or beyond that should be or would be okay with this, is there. You look at institutional goals that they have about graduation rates, you know, four-year graduation rates. Well, look. Take fewer courses, not register for a specific course, drop a course, fail a course. Those are all impacts at uh, uh, completion rates. So this kind of cost is having this, this real kind of academic impact. And so, so now you're depressed, right? Um, but the good news is there, there is something that, that we can do about it. Um, there are options out there. And I think really that's, that's the real reason that this is, is that we don't, I don't think it's common knowledge that there are options. We did the same thing at Minnesota where we looked at electronic textbooks and we looked at rentals, we looked at all those things, and we, after a year of looking at them and studying them and trying to put together some guidance for students, we just said, ugh, this is not gonna really help much at all. And it wasn't until we tripped into what these open textbooks that we said, this is something that could make a real difference, really. And so, if you think about all these issues, again, I'm going to point out if cost wasn't a factor here, <coughs> nothing, right? This, this would be a blank page. There'd be no issues if cost were, these are all caused because of cost. So if we were to dream up the, the, the ideal solution to those problems, it would be what? Textbooks that are? Yeah, ideally they'd be free, right? I mean, there are reduced cost things, or ideally, if you want to completely eliminate that, you have free textbooks. But then the question is always like, who would write a free textbook? Good question. Who would write a free textbook? Textbooks are a lot of work. They're very expensive to do well. To make them, it's very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, who would write a free textbook? Uh, faculty have a lot of priorities going on, right? You've got your tenure to worry about, you've got your teaching, you've got your research, you're, all of that. Why would someone spend the time doing that? Let me, let me explain it. It's actually pretty simple. The way it usually works, publisher invests money, makes a textbook, it gets sold, money goes back to the publisher, they pay the faculty member uh, some royalties, usually around, I think, 8 to 12 percent, somewhere in that range. Um, that's it. That's the model, and it works, and it's the business model for textbooks today. So how could you possibly have a free, how, if you eliminated these sales, how would you ever have money to invest in the creation and so on? Well, it's easy, and, and it's kind of a no-brainer, actually, because this is the same solution that would solve any problem. You have someone donate some money. You have a funder. I know that seems obvious, but like, that's, that's it. That is exactly what has been happening. This isn't just some dream thing like, oh, wouldn't it be great if someone threw money at this problem? They have been, and they've been making these things. So instead, the publisher isn't investing the money, the funder is investing the money, giving it to the publisher saying, make these books, but here's a stipulation. When you make these books, you need to give them away for free for the rest forever. But here's some money. We'll give you money to do it. Right? And then they have money to pay the authors, Right up front, in fact. They don't have to worry about the sales to pay the author. There you go. Pretty simple. Like I said, I mean, you could put anything up there, world hunger, uh, whatever. If you had a funder, you know, seems like at least it'd be a good solution. But th the thing here is that it, it actually has happened. There are funders doing this. Universities are doing it. Um, SUNY created eight open textbooks. Purdue and Oregon State, we're starting to develop a few. Uh, the Hewlett Foundation has invested millions and millions of dollars in creating open textbooks. California passed legislation two years ago basically saying they're gonna create, they're gonna pay 
they're going to fund the creation of 50 open textbooks. And British Columbia quickly said, well, we'll do 60. So it's happening. And in fact, it's happened and is happening. Professional organizations as well, and I'll show you an example of that a little bit later, where professional sc schools, in this case law schools, um, consortia come together and say, let's do this together. Let's, let's write a textbook together. We are the experts in the country on this anyway, so let's do it. And then, get, and w again, all of these people are funding this only if the textbooks are given away for free forever. Because they believe in that. They believe that that can really make a difference, right? So, so that's the new model, except it's missing something really important. Um, if you imagine that, imagine that I handed you a textbook and said, here you go, this is free, just cop go to the copy machine, or here's a digital copy, in fact, just email it to all your students. Or here's a print copy, go, go to the copy machine, just print it off for your students. What kind of questions would go through your mind? Pardon? Is there peer review? Okay, that's a good question. Is it legal? How do you know that? I told you you could, but how do you know that it is? I do want to jump on that peer review one and say that the publishers now that are publishing these things, um, it's the exact same process. They're just funded differently. There are books out there that were created by individuals. Someone who, say, made it for their algebra class and then, gave it, and then said, oh, what the heck, here you go, world. You can have it too. There are those too. Um, but there are more and more of these really professionally created, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, made exactly like a commercial one. Um, so anyway, good, good question there. I know faculty in my college who would say, I'm not going to copy this book. It'd be the end of my career if I were caught doing something you know, academically dishonest, like copying someone else's copywritten work. How do I know I can actually copy this thing? Right? So, so we need one more piece to this puzzle. And that piece is really a solution to copyright here. Now, copyright is a very important tool, obviously, right? I mean, we all rely on it for our intellectual property, our intellectual work. But in this case, where the intent up front, the intent is to share, right? To be given away for free, it kind of gets in the way in this case. So what we need is a solution to that. And the solution to it is the Creative Commons. And um, how many people are, have heard of that before, are aware of it? Wow, okay, great. So the Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization made of a, of a bunch of really smart lawyers. Um, they're, um, uh, what is his title? Director of Education, I believe, is an alum. Cable Green, right, you know Cable, right? And so, um, uh, they are, uh, Larry Les uh, Lessig, if you know who he is, he started Creative Commons and uh, maybe a little more than 10 years ago. So they are intellectual property lawyers and what they've done is they've created licenses. So let's say, um, let's say that I write a book and I, have, I, I own the copyright, as I should, but I do want to, I intend, I just want people to use it. I don't really don't want to make any money off it, just share it. So. Um, normally what would happen is if I give you a copy of the book and you just, and if you wanted to, sh to copy it for your students, what would you need to do? What was that? Permissions, right. You'd have to contact me and say, hey, is it okay if I copy this and give it to my students for free, which most people are not even going to ask because it seems like kind of a dumb question. Can I steal your stuff? Kind of. Uh, so, um, so if my intent is to give it away, then that's kind of a problem because people aren't going to share it unless they know better. So what I will do is I will put a Creative Commons license on that book. And a Creative Commons symbol, basically, Creative Commons license means I'm still the copyright holder. I have not given up my copyright. Uh, my, I'm still the owner of the intellectual property. My copyright still exists. But I'm going to put a contract on top of that that says, you know, these rights that I have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them away, all right? I'm, so if you see this symbol on something, like a book or a video or a website or a whatever, any piece of intellectual property, you know that whoever made it intends for it to be shared. You no longer have to go get permission from me because I've already given you permission. Up front, you know what you can do and what you can't do. 
And, um, and so what open textbooks actually have then are Creative Commons licenses. They've been funded by someone who wants things to share. They put a license on it that tells people this is for sharing. Go ahead and do whatever you want with it. Right? We're set. Um, but the Creative Commons licenses actually do a lot more. They allow you to do these kinds of things as well. Because if you're kind of releasing your stuff into the wild and you want people to really use it, the Creative Commons licenses say, you can use it in all of these, you can do all these things too. And they have certain license components that I'll talk about here in a minute that allow you to do that. But basically, you can make it what you want for your students. So open, there's a lot of confusion about what open is. Open's used in a lot of different contexts. Open is free, but it's also this. There are free textbooks out there that don't have a Creative Commons license on them. I wouldn't copy them myself because I would be a little worried about it. Open textbooks are free with a license that allows you to do these other things. Open is also not necessarily just electronic. You can have electronic textbooks. A lot of your students use e-textbooks, right? They, but they are fully copyrighted and they cannot copy them. They cannot do any of these things. Um, so I want to stress that's what open is. Open is free plus these rights that the intellectual property holder has given you as the instructor. What that means is you can make the content what you want it to be for your students. Right? You can adjust it. I'm going to go through this really quickly, but these are the little the license components of the Creative Commons license. You'll see them stamped on things, and it's very simple. There's four components, and we'll kind of mix and match them. There's buy, which means if you use my thing, just give me attribution. You know, this is by David. NC means non-commercial, means can't sell. You can do all this, uh, this stuff but you can't make money off it. I don't want you making money off it. And I'm the intellectual property holder. I can decide that. This is what you can do. SA means share alike, which means if you mix it without something else or you edit it, whatever you make out of it needs to have this same license on it that I put on it. ND means no derivatives. This isn't really an open component. This means you can't do this mixing and editing. You can copy it and use it and keep it, Share it, but you can't change it at all. Okay. So those are the, what those components mean, and it's Creative Commons arranges them in licenses that make sense. These six licenses here that make sense. But some combinations don't quite make sense. So the most open one is this one. So if you see this on something, this means oh, now I can do all of these things with it, and all I need to do is attribute the author. And then you can see all the other combinations. I don't need to describe each one. These are actually being used all over the internet already. Here's MIT's open courseware, which has been around now for over, a, well over a decade now, where they basically, the president of MIT uh, said, we're going to put all our content out on the web for free and people can use it and whatever. So you can imagine when they first did that, that they got a lot of emails saying, can I use this? Hey, can I use that? Can I copy that? Can I put that in my course site? Can I? So they put a Creative Commons license on it. So you know what you can do with it up front. You do not need to email them, contact them, call them, anything. That's a by NCSA. It means attribute MIT. Don't sell it. And if you make something out of it, this, you need to use this license on whatever you make. Share alike. Fair enough. All right. So now you know the terms. Go for it. Right? And as an instructor, the NC one, you're probably not too concerned about, right? You're not, your intent isn't really to sell it. You want to use it in your course, put it in your course site, use it in your course content. So that's kind of a non-factor almost for you. You've seen TED Talks. And it, most be, it used to be more prominently displayed on the TED website, but now you have to kind of catch it at the end of the video. Right here. This is just a screenshot of one end of one video. Buy non-commercial ND, which means, again, you can't make derivatives. So in other words, you, can, you could take this and put it in your course site, right? But you can't take a chunk of it, or you can't mix other things with it, or lay another soundtrack over it, or edit it in any way. You've got to use it as it is. 
attribute them, and don't sell it. So I don't know why they did that, but they are the intellectual property holders, and they get to decide. So you know up front what you can do. So the internet kind of runs on Creative Commons, actually. I think they just did a study and found that well over a trillion items on the internet are Creative Commons licensed. So, okay, now finally we're going to talk about open textbooks. So open textbooks are textbooks that are licensed in this way. They have Creative Commons licenses. They've been funded by someone who intends for you to share them, use them, mix them, match them, do what is right for your students. And they all have this, they have this Creative Commons license on them. And when we first found them um, over three years ago, when we first kind of started this project, um, again, the biggest problem was my faculty saying, well, where are they? And because they kind of pop up all over the internet, it was kind of challenging to find. So we decided to put together a library of them and put them all in one place so that they're easy to find. The URL's on the bottom here. If you want to use it, there's no, you don't have to like sign up or do anything. You just go in there and click, click, and you've got a book. Um, you can look by your course content. You can look by the, uh, do a search. Um, but we wanted to find, have one place so faculty could find them. Because again, I think the biggest issue is awareness. Just people don't even know these things exist. That people have made textbooks and they intend them to be free and they intend for them to be used and shared and edited. So, some examples. Here's this Cali the, the, uh, Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. These are this consortium of 200, over 200 law schools. I believe it's centered in Cornell, at Cornell. And they publish in this library, in our library, we have uh, I think 25 now legal books from them that they update every year because of course the law changes every year so they need to update them as well. But they kind of do it as a, collabor as a collaborative and then they all benefit from it. Makes perfect sense. They are all licensed, I believe they're all licensed CC by. Rice University has a publishing arm that publishes only open textbooks. And they have some big funders. They got the Gates Foundation, they got the Hewlett Foundation, they have the, I think it's called the Arnold Foundation, which is a, some, I, I think is a Texas-based oil-related foundation, oil money. Anyway, uh, millions of dollars spent on textbooks. Their goal is to provide, um, to build the top 25 enrolled courses in the United States. So they've done a survey and they know which courses have the highest enrollment na nationwide and they're building them one by one. I think they're up to about 10 or 12 books, right? This is probably their most popular one. This is an introductory physics, algebra-based, two-semester physics course. Um, it's huge, it's almost 1,300 pages. Um, you can get it in any of those formats, PDF, EPUB. Um, you, can get, you can buy print versions of them. They print them and they print them in mass so that uh, they are cheaper and then they store them and when you want them, they'll get them to you. Um, you can read it on the web if you want to. Bookshare, they have put it so that I, I'm not really familiar with Bookshare. I don't know if anyone here is, but it's an accessible format. So it's uh, I don't know, screen reader and braille printing um, related. So, I mean, once you open up your content, the things you can do with it are pretty impressive. A publisher would have a hard time putting things out there in all these different formats that people could copy maybe. Ugh. You know? They have an instructor manual. You have to validate that you're an instructor before they'll give you that. It takes, you know, you have to send them a letter and say, yeah, an email. They have PowerPoint slides. They have ancillary materials. They have, they've made connections with, um, third-party vendors so that they can, um, like homework systems, those kinds of things. It might cost a little bit of money because I think those are usually small companies, but they're, that are aligned, the homework problems are aligned with the book and so on. This is it. I mean, this is what publishers are doing, exactly these same things, right? This one's free. The print one costs, I think, in the range of 40 or $50, I don't know something in that range, and which, of course, it's going to cost something. You have to print it. It's 1,300 pages long. 
it tends, the printed copies tend to be about 20% of what a, published, a publisher's similar textbook would be. So we've been going around running workshops at, at institutions with faculty with the goal of getting adoptions. Like I said, I think the biggest problem is awareness. They don't even know that these things exist. Um, when, when I put up this open textbook library, and there are about 107, over 170 books in there now, and it's growing up a work study student who's always working on that, trying to find new ones. Um, I put them in there, but I had no idea whether they were quality or not. I'm not I can't judge that. I can't, I, these are not my content areas. I have a PhD in education. So what am I, I can't say whether they're good or bad. So as we've been going around to institutions running workshops, one thing we've been asking them to do is actually write reviews. And I have some funding from the Hewlett Foundation and some funding from some institutions who are interested in it to fund some of this. And because we don't know, we don't know what the quality is. So far, and this is from the last uh, about 10 months or so of reviews, nine or 10 months, from eight institutions, I would say maybe five of them are research institutions, two of them are four state, yeah, let's see, two or three, yeah, two of them are four year states, colleges maybe, you sign, this is an average, and one's a private. So that's what it is. So that, that's. That's good, I was hoping they would be good. Um, the other thing then, what this is leading to, is when we run these workshops, and like we did this afternoon here, the goal is to educate, make them aware, and then engage them. And we engage them with actually writing a review. And that seems to help with, um, we're getting adoptions, um, I think we're averaging about 40% of the folks who show up at the workshops will end up actually adopting a book. And all we've done is let them know they exist and then paid them a little bit of money to write a very brief review so that we can use it in the library. And it also helps, it is an incentive for them to make it a priority because when I go to a workshop, I tend to go, okay, thanks, and I go back to work, right? So this is something just to keep it on their radar, you know, get them engaged with it. So this is really promising because we're, what, what that says is if we're getting 40% of the faculty who show up, to say, this is doable. That is, I, I, I never could have imagined that when we started this, that 40% of faculty would actually make the leap. But it's happening, and, and it's really, really exciting. So, if that happens, once again, this is toast. Right, for any course that uses an open textbook, no costs, these are gone. These are no longer issues. But there are other things that are happening too because again, open is not just about free. Open is free plus these permissions. You can mix and edit and change and all that. Now that takes effort, right? That takes work. And what I hear, my, my brother's faculty at a state college in Minnesota, and he's like, I don't wanna do that. That's just, he says, I, that's too much work. I get that. He has priorities. He has got to worry about tenure and his research and his teaching and everything else. He doesn't have a lot of time. And, and I've never asked a faculty member to make any adjustments to anything, but what we're finding now, the very first faculty that I've worked with at the University of Minnesota, um, they adopted almost three years ago now, two and a half years. And they're starting to do this, I mean, just completely on their own. They adopted for affordability reasons, but they also, we help them understand, you can do these other things. I'm not gonna ask you to do it because that's asking a lot, um, and what they've done, so I'll give you some examples. There were three faculty who adopted a statistics book, an open statistics book, that the students are thrilled about. Um, they did it for a year, and then after a year, they, they, didn't, they didn't talk to me, they didn't talk to, they just did it. They added a chapter. They said, there's a part of this that we do that's not in the book. They added a chapter. They wrote a thousand multiple choice questions, and uh, they send it back to the author, the original author, and said, here you go, we made this stuff. If you want it, you can have it. And I know the author, actually, and she loves it. And every time I see her, she's, wow, those Minnesota folks are awesome. And, and, and so um, what's happening is we're starting to get these folks, these academics, talking to each other a little bit through the work of these books, which is really exciting. Um, they did the work between three of them. So they split up the work. It really wasn't as much work as they thought. I mean, when they shared the effort, 
it, it worked out okay. They did it in a summer. Um, we have a math faculty member who, who um, decided that he wanted to make some videos. And these are really simple, like laptop, camera, blah, 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 blah. And he made them very simply, very easily, and then uh, and aligned with the content of the open textbook he was using. And then he inserted links into the textbook, put the videos out on YouTube, inserted links to say, if you want to see me work through this problem, go here. If you want to see, you know, he did that all on his own, completely without any support or any help at all. Um, and then um, instructional improvements. So this is kind of a, this one just happened in December where I was talking with three faculty who were using a personal finance open textbook and they've been using it for the two and a half, three years. And they sat down with me because they said, yeah, I don't think we can use this thing anymore. I think this chapter on the consumer price index it's out of date, it has 2010 data, um, you know, so I think we're going to have to go oh, somewhere else. And of course, me, I have a, well, you know, you can edit it. And, you know, they didn't really want to hear that. I mean, they, again, they don't have time, and I get that, but I want to let them, remind them that they could, and they weren't willing to do it. But one of them did chime in and say, you know, the consumer price index data is on the web. It's open. I mean, that chart I had earlier with the consumer price index, I mean, that's where I got it. I got it off the web. And they said, why don't we just take that chapter out and have the students do like original, like primary data research on the consumer price index. Like have them pick some sort of something. They're going to compare the price of this to this or whatever. And they got all very excited and they decided to do exactly that. Now they could have done that without this textbook, right? I mean, they, but what's happening in all of these examples I just listed, it's like, they seem like little things almost, but the excitement that the faculty, it's like they're empowered again, in a way, for their, their courses. Rather than kind of just accepting what's handed to them by Pearson or by the publisher or whoever, they, they're like, oh, we can, we can do that differently. And that is really exciting. And, and it's just happening, I, uh, to say that that had nothing, I mean, I've been trying to instigate lots of things, but not, uh, not that. And so that's pretty cool. I'm going to throw a few more examples. I have a few more minutes, I think. Uh, I'm going to throw this in there, even though I, I, it, this isn't something that I'd think, I think, I doubt Ohio State can do this, because Minnesota can't do this, I don't think. Um, it's more of a community college thing. You'll see why in a minute. But it's called the Z degree. And Tidewater Community College in, I just want to show you an example of what can happen if you really mainstream this. I have a couple of examples. Tidewater Community College created an open, uh, a Z degree. So they took 21 courses in their bachelor, business administration, associate's degree, two-year degree. They decided all 21 courses, open, con open content, it's not going to cost anybody anything. And, um, and then they researched it. They made sure that they researched what happened to both the course, course outcomes and all sorts of and here's what they found. And there was a statistically significant drop in withdrawal rates. There was a statistically significant increase in grades of C or better in the class. The cost was reduced by about 25% for the, for the program, right? This is a community college where tuition, where the textbook cost is a much larger percent of the total cost than it would be at Minnesota or Ohio. And Mainly, I think, you know, they're attributing it to the fact that students had access to the textbook on the first day. There's no one without access ever. There's no reason for it, right? And so that's really pretty exciting. And now there are community colleges trying to duplicate that everywhere. I should also mention that the, in, the, the institution itself increased its revenue because students weren't dropping. They expected enrollment to double the second year. Um, and so anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. I don't know how that would work in a four-year institution. You can imagine how complex that would be with the, um, you know, the liberal ed courses you need to take and how you would piece together a four-year degree. But anyway, it's an idea. I'll plant it in your head. You, you figure it out. I want to show this example out here. This is, we did a workshop at Purdue last year 
And there were two faculty members there from math and um, came, heard about open textbooks, what they were. They did a, re read a review of some of the two books. They went back to their program and talked to their program. For, these are the lower division, right, lower level math courses. So there are a lot of instructors for these courses. They decided to switch those courses to open textbooks, and those courses have about 4,000 students per semester. My memory is that they said, I, this guy could be wrong, but my memory is that they said that the textbooks for those courses were about $200 a, text, a, a textbook. So we're talking $800,000 per semester in savings just in those couple of few courses. So the reason I'm bringing up both a Z degree and this is to show how quickly the impact can be made and huge impact. One instructor, awesome. It'll add up to tens of thousands of dollars. But once you start doing it systematically as a program, it just kind of, it, it changes student experience. Okay, so I think I'm about out of time. So what can we do? Just take a look. Go to that open textbook library if you're a faculty member and just, just look. If there's something that works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But at least you know it's there. You know what an open textbook is. Make the decision yourself. Adopt it if it meets the needs of you and your students and talk to your program. Go back and just let other people know that, again, it's awareness. It's like these things exist. Just um, be aware of it and let other people know. And you have a lot of things going on here. At, 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 uh, programmatically at Ohio State, I think, that you're going to get a lot of support and a lot of encouragement and, um, and a lot of help getting that awareness out there. So, um, I want to, I just want to, I guess, say one more thing, and, and that's that um, the stories are starting to emerge about impact on these. The stories are starting to emerge, like from Tidewater, um, students who are basically saying, this, this allowed me to finish my degree. This allowed me to have a degree and put braces on my daughter. This allowed me to, so um, that, that brings me back to my sons and you know, the things that I want for them. I really, I really think that making, making higher education and what we can control in higher education affordable, uh, you, can really, you can really make a difference. So thank you very much. I think I have some time for questions. Thanks. Do I have time for questions? Is that who's? Yes. Right. Is there like a clearinghouse or something or something that, that goes back and do the peer review on the content that's added? Otherwise, you're just having more of this again. So right. And so, good question. So, if you didn't hear, the question was basically, if you make changes to the content, how do you make sure that those changes are peer reviewed? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I think the, what, what's happening is that these instructors are making changes really for themselves. They're really, they're not making changes and saying, this is better than that. The ones that have made changes are saying, this one works in my classroom. And it really, they'll put it out there. But they are probably not so worried about peer review because they're really just concerned about their own class. Is it within the textbook itself? It can be, but it's their copy. There's still the, the, the main copy out there, right, that does not have their stuff in it. So like the, the statistics faculty, they sent all their stuff. They wrote this chapter and they added a thousand. And it isn't something most stats classes want to have. I think they wanted to use, they teach a real lower level stats. I think it uses Excel to teach stats. I think that was the chapter they added, which most stats classes don't use Excel, I don't think. So anyway, they sent it back. The author said, this is awesome, but didn't include it in anything. I mean, she included a few, some of the questions I think that they had, but decided, nope, this is the core of what needs to be done. Rice University published what she did maybe included some of the questions that they added. But it was ultimately the, uh, and that went through a peer review process. Um, but I think, um, in a way, openness allows for different avenues to peer review too. And I, I haven't really ever said this before because I don't think it's unproven. 
But when you put yourself out there, here's my book and I'm going to put it on the web, um, I think the opportunity for peer review in a different way is there. Again, I don't, it hasn't been proven, and again, I don't usually... The controversy behind Wikipedia anyway. Right, exactly. The controversy behind Wikipedia is in its accuracy, yeah, yep. But I would say that the majority of, of the changes made to the books I was talking about, it's instructors making choices for themselves. So. Uh, the publishers like Rice, like uh, the Rice University is OpenStax, they do that. Um, in fact, um, they're just starting this year the next revisions of the books based on, um, in fact, they're always actually changing any errata that they find, that's errors that they find, but to make major updates, they're, yeah, they're going through that this year. They have funding to do all of that. Um, yeah. Yes? Are you supposed to be running for writing a usable open source text? I've not done it, but uh, I would say it's easily a year. I know that OpenStax, the Rice University folks, they are spending, so this is a professionally created, and I can measure it in money and maybe not time. I know that when I first asked him like a year and a half ago, the editor-in-chief, I said, how much is, are you spending on these? He said $400,000, which is a lot of, I mean, that's people time, right, mostly. There really isn't much but except writing, editing, creating media, peer review, right, $400,000. So I don't know how you turn that into hours, but um, I asked him of, about a couple of months ago, I said, so what is it now? And he said, well, we're adding a lot more supplemental stuff now, so now it's more like 800000 to a $1 million. So, so there's that. That doesn't keep you from creating your own stuff. Like I said, some of the books in the library are faculty, usually math for some reason, who have just made something and said, here you go, world, you know, you can have it not peer reviewed. So what that takes is a very different measure. I, sorry, I can't tell you, I've not done it myself, but it's a lot of work. I've never asked a faculty member to write a book. That's, that's, that's a lot of work, yeah. Um, one of the things I did this fall was I made the print version of my text optional so students can use whatever edition they have it reserved at the library. Oh, wow, well, nice. Yeah, with it. right. Um, do you guys are you looking ahead to maybe developing an online homework platform? It, because what I'm finding is that um, a lot of my students, if you would have told them four or five years ago, one of their courses maybe had online homework associated with it. Right. Now it seems like four to five of their courses right. might have online homework. So it's almost like yep. the paper homework versus the online homework. The online homework is getting the priority because we can right. assign a grade and a grade Right. So how do you see yourself transitioning there? Right. Um, and, and you know what I mean? Because that's kind of where I'm thinking because I love the online homework system. It's yep. working very well. Right. Just drop the DFW grades in your own department. Yep. Um, you know, but where does that fit into your PC? Because I think that's a big part of, of where the... Right. Absolutely. And you hear that all the time because, and, and when people faculty don't move to open textbooks, especially in the math and sciences, the physical sciences especially, it many times is because of that exact reason. This is actually, um, uh, how do I put this lightly? Uh, this is a strategy by publishers. I mean, they know that they've lost the content war in a way. They, they see it coming. And they're not even fighting it, frankly. And they did years ago, just open content. They know that, but what they're doing is creating these value added things, which is awesome. I mean, they do provide a lot of value. They help students. Um, so can we do that too, right? I mean, it can open have that kind of thing. Now that's gonna depend on the publisher because right, the books that we have in the library aren't, you know, they're not mine. Those are made by somebody like Rice University or where they're coming from all over. Some places do have that. Um, the one you mentioned, the biology, right? Said so it has, the, has the, the homework help thing, the homework system. Um, some of those are for our companies where there's a small charge. I don't remember what that one was. It was Pretty small, like 10, 5, 10, more than that? I thought I saw $53, but I oh, think okay. was to print out paper. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that sounds about right. So there's another, some of you know that Ohio State is a part of the new Unison um, consortium, which is very focused on learning, the learning management ecosystem. And I actually think, for those of you who work for Mike Hopper, um, that, you know, 
helping to move that consortium. Because yeah. um, one of the reasons we signed on was to be able to move that agenda and be part of the steering. So you're, you hit on a very important yeah. thing. It's another yeah. thing. I'm the director of others. So you, I got to buy everything. It's another thing your department has to buy or the campus has to buy. And so right. if we can weave it into something that isn't controlled commercially, right. that we control ourselves, and we can lower our costs around. Right, yes, exactly. There are some systems out there already, There's especially in math, that are open and free. Um, but for everything else, it's still, we need support, yep. Yes? I just wanted to go back to your business model um, sure. scenario, and, and I'm an English professor, among other things, and the English textbooks tend to have oh, yeah. and a whole other sort of range of issues, including getting permission from libraries or museums to to get artifacts originally into the textbook. So you don't need to just pay an author and need to pay right. commissions up front. Right. The ones that I've done, generally they've had companies that say, what do you think the print run is gonna be? What's right. it gonna be sold? And I'm wondering if you think we're making traction with holding institutions of some of the artifacts we wanna put in, in terms of that upfront business model that would get those kinds of um, artifacts into the textbook. Yeah, and I don't think I can answer that. And you're, you're talking about there are basically original works. Right. Which is very. I don't want to have a particular painting that's in the Columbus Museum of Art. Right, right, right. That copies that they hold in a database that they want me to pay them to make a textbook. Right, right. Generally, that business model has been based on sales. Right. So we have. Right. Agreed, and I and I the arts are, and, and and the humanities are really tough. Be yeah, and because it, we're talking about these ori these original works that you can't just make a generic version of, right? You, you, so um, that is tough, and I and and it, it isn't really unless the original copyright holders decide to release it openly. <laughs> Right. I would guess your best shot at that is your libraries, at that kind of work. Uh, or, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of what they do. I mean, I know that our libraries have certainly talked about it. If you want to use this, let us know, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, yeah, to right. Get that speech in the book. That's they did exactly a great right. job with it. Yep, right. right. They can manipulate it, but they need to raise that funding ahead of time. Gotcha. Yep. They could include that in one of their shows. Right, so they need a funder, right? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yes. I have a question about the reviews you're having uh, after review of the books. Right. Are you using that information and sharing it kind of like a start yes. system? Yes, exactly. If you go to that URL to open.umn.edu, um, yeah, they really serve two purposes. Number one, just to get the faculty to stop and look, uh, engagement. But the other is then um, they will, we warn them up front that these are going into that library. So we have those 120 some reviews in the last eight months or nine months. Uh, they are in there. So if you go in there, you see them. Um, it, it isn't a lot yet because we have 170 some books. And some books have four reviews. So there are a lot of books that have no review yet. But yes, they are all put in there and they are actually shared with a Creative Commons CC by license. So if you want to take them and use them somewhere else, you can. The reviews themselves. So yeah, they can put there so that others can see them. And they do have a star, they have star ratings. The intent is just a very first look, right? It is not supposed to be some in-depth academic analysis of the book, so. Okay, anything else? Thank you.